Uh, good morning. Um, today I want to talk on the topic I've entitled Christ and Ego. The title itself sounds religious per se or particularistically religious. Uh, it's not the point of this uh, podcast. And uh, similar to prior introduction of religious uh, elements, it's not the particular religious or confined religious notion I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to get at uh, something more universal and more applicable right across the across the spectrum. Uh, so, in contemporary times, people define themselves religiously along a spectrum. People can be a classical member of any given religion or denomination. I'm Lutheran. I'm Buddhist. I'm uh, uh, pure land Buddhist, and, and on and on. Uh, then you can have, I'm Muslim, but not in the conventional way. I'm Jewish, but not in the conventional way. Next out, you could say. Um, uh, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Next out, you could say. I'm open, or um, and on and on, all the way out to atheism, which in my view is I live in a neighborhood with a lot of sirens. Anyway, I was describing atheism as the most extreme version of faith available on the religion spectrum. Um, that's certitude in, in and certitude over something absolutely not knowable. A, a remarkable expression of faith. In my view, atheists far outstrip theists in their capacity to be sure of something unknowable. But that's not the point of uh, where I'm going on this. So we have all these. We have all these options of the way people regard themselves religiously or spiritually in contemporary times. And uh, in, in order to speak to that, I, I stumbled across a passage, or a passage inspired my thoughts on this matter. And it reads like this. Therefore, the ultimate purpose pursued by Christianity is not to build the kingdom of Christianity or the world of Christianity. Its most important mission is to make preparations to become a qualified bride to receive the bridegroom. All right, that's hardcore, Christian, straight down the line. It's a concept that obtains in Christianity grounded in Scripture, um, of the bridesmaids keeping their lanterns lit. It's the, it's the image of awaiting the return of Christ and being properly prepared for that. If we were to translate that into contemporary times in which the genders finally have been uh, liberated from classical uh, gender roles, uh, the husband would be similarly preparing for his wedding night um, it's basically that the jitters, the wanting to be most perfect, most beautiful, most pure, wanting to present oneself as infinitely desirable and trustworthy. It's, it's the, the preparation of the bride to receive the bridegroom or the preparation of any individual to receive their marriage partner is a posture of being eternally unworthy, eternally wanting to do more, eternally wanting to be better, eternally wanting to arrive at the moment of wedding uh, bond in the best way I could possibly be. And this is what is introduced here out of Christian scriptures and what, and what brought my thoughts to this issue of ego uh, because in the face, it's only in the face of presenting oneself to something to which I, to which I'm never worthy. I'll never be good enough. This is by no means beating myself up. It's by no means having a negative self confidence, self concept. It's by no means bearing the burden of guilt or insufficiency. It is a posture that there is something that 
I want so much to be so perfect in front of. It's like, it's like I'm going to do my piano recital for the principal or for the queen or it's that feeling of I'll practice a million times and I wish I could have practiced one more time. This is the core concept of expressed in Christian terms here as the bride preparing herself to receive the bridegroom or as I've tried to translate into gender equal concepts of any one of us preparing ourselves to meet our eternal life partner in love. And I wish I could be better. I wish I could be richer. I wish I could be more pure. I wish I could be more inspiring. I wish I could be cleaner, finer, better, brighter in every way. And this was how, this was how uh, Christian scriptures and Christian interpreters encouraged Christianity to regard itself or hold itself or keep itself in the period of time until the promised return of Christ. Um, and here this speaker, or the person I'm reading, says, the mission of Christianity is not to build the kingdom of Christianity or the world of Christianity. And here is the subtle tripping point, subtle dividing line. And something that I really want to speak to contemporary times and uh, contemporary directions in spirituality. If I think I have something good to give, I want to share it widely. In the process of that occurring, people come to regard what I have to give, whether I'm a fiddler or a doctor or whatever, or, or an expert on uh, kombucha or whatever, in the process of me offering genuine and authentic, helpful information and value, people come to take interest in that, come to adhere to it, come to be inspired by it. I was, you know, lethargic, and then I started drinking this particular brand of alfalfa or whatever, that, you know, and, and now I'm energetic, and I just want to share it. I just want to tell you, you should, you should also try this alfalfa uh, uh, recipe or whatever. It'll really help you, and so on and so forth. And so there's always an initial impulse, same with Christians, same with Buddhists, same with Jews. There's an, an initial impulse to want to share something that has been helpful to me. And this goes on and on, whether it's an individual, whether it's a massive billion-person religion. It goes on and on until, until there's a tripping point in which those who are not listening are considered problematic. They're missing the point. And the speaker, whether it's, you know, whether it's somebody teaching you how to listen in, in you know, in, in 20 second patches, listen better or repeat what's, whatever. It's, it's suddenly the person who's unwilling to hear your great advice is, is, needs to be convinced in some way. And it's that minor trip, whether it's an individual, whether it's a, a product, whether it's a movement, whether it's a major religion, it's that, it's that last, it's that minor twist in which now I'm trying to expand the kingdom of my great knowledge, whether it's, whether it's being a Christian or a Muslim, whether it's being, uh, whether it's, you know, selling uh, uh, kombucha or, or uh, or crystals that you know if I sleep on them with my temples or whatever it's it doesn't matter what the thing is they're all helpful to start they're all genuinely helpful to start but in the absence of this element in which I am permanently in the posture and position of a bride preparing for a bridegroom or a man preparing for his wedding night a permanent posture of positioned in front of something I can never be good enough. I want to get better, I want to get better, I want to get better. This, this infinite desire to present oneself as ever better is, is, a, uh, is a, uh, a humility that never goes away. There's no end to one's humility. 
I could have a million followers and I may have to pr present myself to followers as knowing what I'm talking about and they want me to know what I'm talking about. But my po the reality of myself is that I face something toward which I'll never be enough. I'll never be good enough. I'll never be as good as I want to be. And the, the metaphor of doing that, having that as my marriage partner is perfectly, is perfect, in fact. I have a wife. I'll never be worthy of her. I'll never be good enough for her. Every day, all I try to do is try to become better for her. And it doesn't mean that now I'm burdened with guilt and, 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 and self, negative self By no means, not at all. It's just that once one is once one is oriented towards something, whether it's Christ or God, something that I always want to improve for, and that I myself am not the point. I myself uh, need to do more. That is what retains. That is what retains the freshness of anyone who has anything to give. In, in, uh, in response, uh, I mean, related to that is the contemporary trend of spiritual but not religious. This is something like, it might work, I, I don't know, but it's a little bit like I'm the master of my own shit. Don't tell me what to do. I'm spiritual. I, I pick and choose, but there's nothing toward which, toward which I'm, I'm surrendered. I'm the bride preparing for the bridegroom. I'm, th there's, I'm always insufficient. To to be the author of one's own, of one's own. Untethered, kind of spiritual self building. It's fine for most lives. Uh, it's fine until the rubber hits the road. It's fine until uh, the point at which um, someone who's not listening to me uh, is not, is not uh, getting it. And that's wrong. That's wrong. Same with a Christian knocking on your door. You're not listening to me. You're not getting it. And everyone has that point. And that's why... Um, that's why kind of true religious formation needs to have in it this uh, pathway or this uh, altar or doorstep. An altar is like a threshold. The, before stepping in, I, I, wish I, I wish I had done more to be better. That humility is infinitely attractive. Uh, and it's the ego, it's the ego which trips one from giving to not comprehending those disinterested or uninterested or unpersuaded. It's the ego. And there's, every, every, there's billions of things uh, introduced to try to suppress the ego or keep the ego down. But in the posture of a bride or a, bride or, or a, a man waiting for his wedding night, or, or a person in front of Christ or in front of God, in that posture, no ego can arise. It simply can't arise. It's not trying to get rid of it. It's a place from which it can't arise. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for listening. Talk soon.